Um, it's a great uh, privilege and honor for us at NUPI to welcome Professor Amitav Acharya uh, from American University to give a keynote on global order and north-south relations. Professor Acharya is the uh, he's distinguished professor and the UNESCO chair in transnational governance at American University. Uh, he's the former president of the International Studies Association, and he publishes books more frequent than the rest of us publishes articles. He has, in the last couple of years, published books on reimagining international relations, uh, making international relations truly global constructing world order, and the end of American world order. I'll now give the floor to Professor Acharya, and then after his talk, uh, we will have a chat <laughs> and follow up with some questions that are of relevance to uh, Norway and Norwegian uh, foreign policy. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to come here and uh, share my ideas with you. Thanks to NUPI and uh, thanks to the Norwegian Foreign Ministry. And also, it was a real privilege to share at least the sitting area with the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister. <clears throat> I will go straight to my topic. And this is about uh, global order. Uh, where it is going, and uh, what are the challenges we might face. So just think about uh, 10 years ago, uh, that would be 2013, when uh, <clears throat> Barack Obama was the American president. And uh, many people also thought that uh, his successor would be Hillary L <coughs> Clinton, Hillary Rodham Clinton, who was the Secretary of State uh, for Obama's first term. Donald Trump's name was not there. I mean, everybody knew what Trump is, but when you talk about Trump uh, as a candidate, uh, people will chuckle uh, and uh, smile or smirk. The liberal international order, which, uh, by which I mean the world order that United States nurtured, built, and maintained from 1945 uh, onwards, seemed to be alive and well. There has been some hiccups, the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. But nobody, to the best of my knowledge, had said this order is going to be, uh, would decline and fall so rapidly in the decade ahead. But then, uh, of course, we have a series of uh, uh, challenges to that order. Uh, you have uh, the election of Donald Trump in 2016 U.S. presidential elections, which again was uh, unexpected. Even Trump did not believe he will be elected. Uh, then we had the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the global pandemic, global scale, which again, uh, some people said they might have predicted it, but I can't think of anybody who said the scale and the devastation and the deaths caused by the pandemic had been predicted. And then we, of course, have the Russian invasion of Ukraine last uh, 2022. All these things happening in rapid succession, the future outlook of world order is not very different than what it was in 2013. However, writing, I, um, in uh, actually Oxford, I had a Christian Sun Fellowship at St. Catherine's College in Oxford, and I was supposed to write a book. And uh, in 2013, I, uh, basically drafted a monograph in, in three months, which was published in 2014, called The End of American World Order. Now, the idea of that book was not that the United States is declining. A lot of uh, scholars from Paul Kennedy onwards talk about the decline of the US, and then it goes like a fashion for a few years, then the United States comes back, and uh, so this has been an unsettled debate. For my take was a little different, and very different. It's not America's own decline as a power or the superpower or the state, but it's the order America built, the world order America built. So the title of the book there, therefore was not the decline of US, but the decline of American world order. 
And the argument was that liberal order is in mortal danger, crisis. And this is at the height of Obama and Clinton era. And uh, the reason why I felt uh, that this needed to be said is because there are a lot of hype about the liberal order, that uh, this uh, liberal order is open, uh, easy to get in, hard to get out, and it will co-opt rising powers like China, uh, even Russia, and everything will be uh, happy and uh, there will be some crisis, of course, uh, like the crisis, financial crisis, uh, the 2003 US invasion of Iraq, but those are not something that will fundamentally challenge or, <clears throat> or wreck the liberal order. Now, very few people think like that. Um, somebody mentioned about uh, the world being uh, sleeping while the First World War happened when the world was uh, uh, sleeping, or Second World War for the matter. But I think the liberal order and its uh, implosion happened when the West was sleeping. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations in New York published a article, special issue, just after Trump's election in uh, January 2017, where it referred to the liberal order in the past tense. Why we will, the order that was, not is. And, uh, but where was this? Uh, I'm not criticizing the council itself as one entity, but I think generally there was a huge sense of complacency, despite some dissenting voices, that the, you know, it will be business as usual. The United States has come back uh, and uh, is the sole superpower. The order it built will continue, it will expand, it will co opt uh, other, other, uh, other rising powers. And uh, in the meantime, all the long term challenges that were happening could somehow be managed and without fundamentally altering the structure of world order. Now, I am, of course, simplifying a little bit of a very complex debate. There are other people who did talk about uh, the relative uh, decline of the United States. But again, even Farid Jakaria, who wrote this book, The Post-American World, in 2008, every time you see a book coming out of the US, thinking about the decline of the US. There will be a last section, we'll have a section there, how can the US come back uh, again? I have never seen a book that doesn't have that. I mean, for, for this book, um, had the same thing, that these are the five things US needs to do to become number one again. That nobody in the United States has accepted that they would ever become number two. This is unthinkable, that US could ever be number two. And uh, living in Washington, when I uh, talk about my book, I joke that uh, Democrat or Republican America will be always number one. It rhymes very well. Now, that is no longer the case. So in the last uh, few years, especially since uh, Trump, it's as if the, you know, the United States has woken up, the policy community has woken up, that something seriously has ch uh, happening. And they blame it on Trump. Uh, in reality, the crisis and decline of the order happened well before Trump. It had to do with uh, structural changes. You know, world orders like nation states, like empires rise and fall. So there is no uh, you know, basis to say a world order will continue. And uh, there were structural changes that rise with, uh, not only China, but uh, other developing countries. And I'm not talking about just the big developing countries like China and India, but general rise of the rest. There was also the long-term uh, kind of lingering but building up tension in globalization, increasing resistance to globalization from within the West. Uh, because uh, as tr Trump put it, that uh, globalization and the international institutions that promoted uh, have not benefited the US. Uh, there are backlash within the UK, the Brexit. So in some ways, the crisis of the liberal order was not because of China or India, it was because of uh, tensions that were building up within that order because of economic disparities and the perception that this order has not really benefited at least a sizable section of the West. So now we are talking about uh, the post-Ukraine conflict uh, situation. And uh, I'll give you a few hints, but then now we'll have a Q&A or a discussion uh, after my uh, initial presentation. I'm happy to elaborate. I think the world order is going in the direction that we have never seen 
before, at least in the last 500 years. The last 500 years have been dominated by the West. Even though China was still the largest economy in the world until the 18th century, India was the second largest economy in the 18th century. Uh, uh, well, the Mughal Empire, Aurangzeb, India, was actually the largest economy in the world. So maybe it's the last 300 years, the world order has been dominated by the decline of the rest and the rise of the West, and uh, the institutions and uh, norms that we have today defining today's world order, basically European uh, uh, state system writ large, European norms and institutions, Westphalia, uh, sovereignty, non-intervention, these are European norms. <clears throat> these become globalized. So we haven't seen anything uh, like that, maybe, unless you have a very long memory, you were born before that, but history books tell you that there have been a lot of different types of world order in the past. And some of that will become probably, it's not reality, but continued, uh, it will become more prominent in the coming world order. Uh, first of all, I believe that the emerging world order would be decentered. There will be no global hegemony. Global hegemony is very rare in history. Regional hegemony is possible. Uh, this is one thing I agree with John Mearsheimer, a political scientist in the U.S., that uh, global hegemony is very difficult to have. Britain managed to do that. United States managed to do that. But uh, the Roman Empire was not a global hegemon. The Han Empire was not a global hegemon. So there will be no global hegemony of a single power. There will be a decentered world. Uh, the West will decline, but not disappear. Uh, those who say, including the liberal order, it will remain. But what is happening now, you, you see that the liberal order in the uh, early 2000s and 2010s thought about becoming the truly universal order. But now it is going back to what it was before. I had argued that the liberal order was never truly universal. It was a club of the West. It's a transatlantic club with uh, um, in Australia and New Zealand and Japan invited in. It never really included India, uh, Ch China. The vast majority of the world was outside of the liberal order. And uh, it was basically liberal democracies. Now the liberal order is becoming like that. Uh, it is no longer like a, the globally inclusive order, but it is again, once again, a club of the West. And the more the talk about the rise of the West, the Ukraine uh, conflict has actually led to West is back. There was actually uh, a blog in Council on Foreign Relations that said the West is back. Look what is happening to Putin, the unprecedented sanctions uh, that uh, US has mobilized, or Europe has mobilized against Russia. The West is back. And uh, then uh, there is also uh, the idea that uh, the war is benefiting the United States in a way that nobody would have imagined. The United States now is the largest supplier of uh, uh, LNG uh, to, I'm not sure it is to Europe or to in the world. Uh, United States has uh, increased the share of uh, global arms manufacturing and exports by almost 10%. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the Europe is much more dependent on the United States than it was ever before. The idea of a European security autonomy that uh, France and Germany talked about during Trump, nobody talks about it seriously anymore. The United States actually, in a sense, is the biggest gainer of the world, uh, the Ukraine conflict. But the contradiction is that despite the apparent unity of the West and the relative sort of a gain for the United States, the Western-dominated world order is actually going to decline even further. Because as the West becomes more united during uh, the uh, last couple of years, uh, <clears throat> the rest of the world increases its fear of the West. And here I want to make a very important point. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is illegal under international law, and most of the world recognizes this. Most of the global south, global south is not a coherent entity. There are a lot of variations. Well, like China and India and uh, Africa are not having the same geopolitical view. But in general, global south condemns the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But that does not translate into supporting the West and the return and revival of the West. In fact, it creates fear. Uh, fear because of economic coercion, the threat of economic third third-party sanctions or secondary sanctions, the fact that uh, you, if the, you know, your assets can be frozen uh, in one day uh, uh, by United States, if Russian assets can be frozen, what about the assets of other uh, developing countries? Uh, so the coercive power of the West is very much in ev uh, evidence. 
NATO expansion, not NATO expansion just uh, in Europe, the Scandinavian NATO, for example, but the talk, sometimes loose but sometimes serious, about the global NATO, expanding NATO to Asia, uh, or uh, creating a global role for NATO, uh, like uh, the briefly, uh, <coughs> the, the uh, Prime Minister Liz Strauss, who didn't last very long, she actually was talking about global NATO. NATO has every right to have a role in Asia. These sort of things don't go down very well, not only the, with the enemies of the United States, but with the friends of the United States. Because it seems like you know, when the, United, the West is losing its political and diplomatic clout, its soft power, it is resorting to NATO. NATO has replaced the United Nations as the means of Western dominance. Now, this perception may be new here, but it, is, it does exist. One of the reasons why Asia is relatively more stable, and this is a very controversial proposition, uh, but surely you know that after the end of the Cold War, many people predicted Asia's future is Europe's past. So uh, Europe's uh, past, like the rise of Germany, will basically replicate itself in the rise of China. But uh, so far, Asia hasn't had the kind of big war that Europe has had. Europe has a, heart, a war in the middle of, uh, at the heart of Europe. Asia may have one. The, you know, many Western pundits keep predicting that. Uh, but so far, it hasn't. And one of the reasons is because Asia actually has followed what Europe had preached before. And that is the idea of cooperative security, Co uh, you know, the security with rather than security against. There is no regional organization in Asia that doesn't include China. There are many, uh, there's no NATO in Asia. Uh, and uh, that's a paper I wrote uh, and a book I wrote in 2009 actually made that argument why there is no NATO in Asia, uh, because there is a normative uh, predisposition against it and also the consequences of what is called provocative defense as opposed to non-provocative defense. It's very much practiced by Asians, even though it is preached by Europeans. So that's my final point is that what implications for Norway and Scandinavia? Norway, at one point, uh, when I became aware of international relations, to me was kind of the epitome of a middle power. A uh, middle power do good things, like Canada. I, I, uh, I happened to study in Australia, a middle power, and then lived and worked in Canada, built my career. And Norway was bracketed with Australia and uh, Canada as a middle power, peace-making all the Scandinavian countries known for their peace studies. They were the biggest champions of peace studies. I'm afraid that is no longer considered so. Uh, at the moment. Somehow it's being blurred. And uh, it's just become a normal country. That's my kind of, uh, my deep provocation. I'd love to hear your response from that. Thank you very much. I'll take your questions. Thank you so much um, for an excellent overview and introduction to uh, this topic. So I think one interesting question here is, you mentioned that uh, the new order will be quite different. Uh, you have in your scholarship talked about uh, a multiplex order. Um, what I think is, is perhaps interesting to drill down uh, into a little bit is what are the concrete implications of such uh, an order, specifically in terms of the rules and norms that will define what that order is? I ask because you see already attempts to rewrite norms and rules within the international system, so that there is a clash there. So I'm, I'm wondering how will that tension and the changes in distribution of power impact on who's writing the rules and who's, who's interpret the, interpreting them and, and applying them? So if you talk about uh, norms and rules, uh, there is this concept of rules-based uh, international order. Mm -hmm. um, it is useful to disaggregate it. There are security rules and there are economic rules and there are sort of humanitarian rules. And uh, all of these are under challenge. But uh, if you take a long-term view, um, Rules are always challenged. Rules are always contested. Uh, in the literature on internal norms uh, that I uh, follow or I have helped to contribute, we look at rules as being permanently contested 
rather than internalized. So the creation and maintenance, maintenance of rules is not a linear process. So right now we have uh, rules of territorial integrity violated by Russia. That is one of the more successful international norms, uh, but uh, that's under attack. But rules of sovereignty and uh, political intervention, known intervention, has been always violated. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States intervened, attacked, invaded Iraq in 2003 without any uh, proof. And it later on, uh, found, you know, it was very clear that the proofs the U.S. provided or claimed was spurious. Uh, so the United States uh, did not... Uh, accept jurisdiction of international, uh, the Court of Justice on territorial conflict, more recently on WTO. Uh, so different countries violate different rules when it suits their interest. Mm. And um, you have also, uh, when it comes to humanitarian uh, rules and uh, humanitarian law, I think that's where uh, a lot of rules have consistently been violated, not just by the West, but allies of the West. Mm. Uh, and uh, we can talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and uh, we can talk about uh, uh, human rights in con countries that have no real human rights, like the Middle Eastern countries. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, when Iran violates human rights, a uh, big noise when this happens in Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, first of all, you can condemn, but then you gloss it over. So I think uh, most of the world is uh, a bit skeptical about the claim of a rules-based order uh, that had existed under the watch of the United States. It's better to say that the rules that we have have been there, they have been violated, but they have also been reinforced, and uh, one or two episodes are not going to get rid of the, the rules. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm saying how many countries really impose sanctions on the U.S. for its invasion of Iraq? Uh, how many General Assembly resolutions were passed? None. Uh, only, only person in the UN who said the US invasion of Iraq was illegal was Kofi Annan. And Kofi Annan had already had his second term, so you could kind of probably say that. Um, uh, so I'm being a bit cynical. Uh, so let's assume that the so-called, we're not in a perfect world, rules are always going to be violated. The Ukraine, uh, inv the invasion of Ukraine might have paradoxically strengthened the rule of territorial integrity because most people are aware uh, of what it is. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, countries will be more careful because the extent of uh, economic consequence and international condemnation will make countries think twice before uh, they blatantly invade another country. So um, I am not totally pessimistic about uh, the fall of uh, the disappearance of international rules. But I think uh, you will see that uh, there will be more attempts to create uh, uh, regional rules, uh, regional conventions of the kind the European Union has done or ASEAN has done. And uh, the rules will be always contested, but I don't think they'll disappear. Uh, in, in a, we're not going to get back to being in a jungle, like the people say, all hell will break loose and the world will become a jungle. I doubt that. But related to this, I think, is also uh, this issue of the world becoming um, more interdependent and integrated economically um, with lots of private actors being very, very important as, uh, as actors in their own right, but also as instruments for foreign policy. Now we see this now with sanctions against uh, uh, Russia with the war, uh, but it does raise a question about whether the strategies for trying to wield influence vis-a-vis -vis others will look different in a world order where there will not be the same type of dominance by Western state, but yet you will have a set of economic actors and interdependence that opens up a new area for trying to, to engage in, in power political uh, behavior, basically. So there are several things you asked uh, in that question. First of all, the future of globalization and interdependence. Mm. Uh, that's certainly going to change. It was already changing. The idea of a global village, uh, you know, the hyper neoliberal globalization, the World Economic Forum model, I think is passe, because there's too much backlash. It had nothing to do with Russia-Ukraine conflict, nothing to do with COVID. There was already resistance building up to the inequalities caused by globalization, both in the developed and developing countries. But doesn't mean globalization will disappear. Well, I think uh, 
In the last 100 years or so, globalization has been led mostly by the West. Now you would see globalization led by multiple other countries. I have a term called multiplex world. It's not a multipolar world where great powers call the shots or bipolar where two powers call the shots or unipolar. A multiplex world is multiple actors, not just great powers, but also uh, regional actors, non-state actors who are, who are consequential and they make an impact on the overall uh, world order. So if you look at that uh, in terms of uh, apply that to cooperation, uh, leadership, uh, you'll see a very different world. Mm -hmm. I think some kind of uh, uh, interdependence will continue. I mean, uh, like a couple of years ago, at the height of the global pandemic, the East Asian countries signed something called RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the largest trading area in the world, if it goes according to plans. So, th so that means East Asian countries do not reject globalization mm. the way you know, some people in the West do. Uh, regional uh, uh, integration me mechanisms continue. So I would think that globalization would be more uh, fragmented it don't be the kind of neoliberal globalization uh, dictated by the IMF or, 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 or the West. Uh, similarly, if you look at leadership, uh, I think leadership is going to depend on issue areas. I, I actually call it G plus leadership, not G zero. Some people think leadership has disappeared, but I think leadership is becoming functionally specific. Uh, somebody mentioned climate change earlier, we discussed. When you come to climate change, we don't think of the United States as a leader. We don't think China is the leader. We actually think of Europe as the leader. Um, when it comes to military, we think of United States as the number one power. If not leader, it can be if it wants to go multilateral. Power is not the same as leadership. When it comes to international development, unquestionably, China is the leader. I mean, it may not sound nice and good, but China provides more international development aid, including the BRI framework, than any other country. So maybe leadership is more pluralized, issue-specific, and uh, depends on uh, at what time and what context. India provided a lot of uh, uh, benefit uh, when it comes to vaccines, uh, with co cooperation partly with the West. Those vaccines are actually better than the vaccines produced by China, not maybe as good as the vaccines produced by, uh, by the West, but still, I'm talking about leadership at different levels of governance, mm -hmm. different uh, mm -hmm. issue areas. So instead of saying a liberal order or a unipolar uh, is like applies to everything, I think we should look at uh, leadership uh, and innovation in issue, issue areas and according to regions. That's the idea of a multiplex world as opposed to multipolar. And a multipolar world is a very great power-centric world. You know, it's the European 19th century, early 20th century. All the great powers, either they cooperate or the uh, sorry, conflict, uh, or, or go to war or, or cooperate like concert of powers. The rest of the world has very little say. Mm. Uh, we are not, I mean, the power distribution may be multipolar, but the overall world order architecture will be much more than just distribution of power. Mm. And this kind of complexity gets in there. So I think from a um, Norwegian perspective, there is one uh, fairly important question, which is uh, that, uh, so Norwegian foreign policy, I think it's fair to say, the foreign minister may, may correct me on this, but uh, there, there, there is the idea that investing in multilateral institutions is the same as supporting a rules-based order. Sorry, investing, investing in so Nor Norwegian foreign policy, development policy, is heavily, heavily tilted towards support to multilateral yes, institutions. Yes. And there is this idea that by doing so, we support a rules-based international order. Now, can you reflect a little bit on the implications of the, the world that you think that yeah. we're heading into, whether that type of strategy holds? So here, here is my take. Uh, Absolutely agree that Norwegian foreign policy supporting multilateralism has been beneficial. But the nature of multilateralism is changing. So you can't put all your money in the UN system. UN is not the only game in town. Sounds like a heretical thing to say. There are other types of multilateralism, ad hoc multilateralism, regional multilateralism. So, so if your foreign policy is to support uh, basically uh, uh, the UN as institutions, nobody can quarrel with that. But how about supporting alternative 
forms of multilateralism, regional organizations, uh, which actually do a good job in some, some many areas. Mm -hmm. And similarly, uh, say, Norway is still uh, considered or perceived as a Western country and acts through not a member of the European Union, but European uh, Schengen uh, immigration system, uh, member of NATO. But how about investing more on uh, outside of all of this, uh, creating and encouraging uh, multilateral cooperation, regional cooperation, which uh, is nothing to do with these institutions. Uh, for example, I have heard, and I might have benefited from a lot of Norwegian-funded initiatives in the US, UN, uh, but I would like to see an, um, initiatives like uh, supporting regional cooperation, say, in Southeast Asia, supporting regional cooperation in Africa, uh, having partners, uh, for example, uh, the traditional partners of Norway would be at the Scandinavian level, at the European level, and the United States and the West. How about building partnerships with important, uh, say, emerging powers? Having, having a, a, you may already have it, right? but like Indonesia. Uh, how about a partnership with Indonesia, which is actually a very constructive player uh, in, uh, in not only Southeast Asia, but, in, but in, the, in the whole world. So... India would be another case, but there will be also such, uh, uh, such states in Africa, Latin America. So I think uh, broadening foreign policy to choose like-minded partners and where you could actually have quite a significant amount of influence mm -hmm. uh, and uh, trying to induce them to accept the values that, uh, that are great values that Norway is promoting. Maybe... Uh, a more effective strategy in a multiplex world than the, you know, putting all the money into UN-related institutions, the Western institutions, uh, that has been the case in a bipolar or a, a unipolar world. Okay. On that note, I thank you so much for, for your lecture and the conversation. Thank you. I hope I didn't subvert your foreign policy.